We're continuing our series on the unchanging God. On the unchanging God. Are you glad that our God never changes? I am too. I'm so glad. Because, friends, we live in a world that is constantly changing. Constantly changing. But with God, there is security. There is stability. There is serenity. His character doesn't change. His promises never change. His word never changes. His purpose for us never changes. And with that, we can have security. There's, there's a great sense of, of dependence we can have on God, a God who never changes. Just like the song we sang. Our God is what? Unchangeable, unshakable, and unstoppable. Here's the question that's important. What about you? Do you personally feel that you need to change? Do you personally feel you need to change? If you are seated beside the person who is a family member who knows you in some way, can you turn to that person and ask them this question, do I need to change? Go ahead, ask them. Do I need to change? And what's their answer? Yes. Wonderful. You're so humble, you guys. You're so humble. You all need to change. No one's perfect, right? Anyone perfect here? Okay, we're all in this together. Here's the question. Do you recognize the spiritual mental and emotional areas of your life that need to change. That's what's important. I want you to think right now, think right now, what are those areas in my personal life that I need to change? What are just the three, just three major areas? There might be more, there might be a few less, but, but what are the three major areas in your life that you need to change? I'm going to ask you in a little while just to write them down, Okay. Because I want to make this message really meaningful, really applicable in our lives. Are you frustrated? Are you frustrated today that you've been a Christian for months or years and you still are in bondage to these sins, to these things that tempt you, that cause you to fall and turn your backs on God? What are those areas in your life? Don't believe the myth that says, as soon as you receive Jesus Christ and commit your life to Him, you will suddenly change. It doesn't happen that way. Don't believe the myth that life change happens naturally over time. Don't believe that. Don't believe the myth that, that life change will come about as you try harder and harder and harder. Don't believe any of that. The one thing that will change without our wanting to is our physical bodies. Would you agree? Whether you like it or not, your body will change. That's one thing. Now, think about it. In this message today, in the one hour that you listen, about half a million cells in your body are going to die in the next hour. Not from what I say or what you hear, huh? but they will die. But the good news is that half a million cells in your body will be replaced in the next hour. And that's amazing. Your skin is going to replace itself every month. Do you realize that? Your skin replaces itself every month. Your stomach lining undergoes a complete change in five days. In five days, it completely changes. I haven't mentioned how many hairs you lose, but you lose over 100 strands of hair each day. Now, some of you might not lose that many, but uh, you don't might have that, that much to lose, so don't worry. But at the same time, you know, wrinkles develop. Stomachs bulge. What else? Muscles ache and pa they're painful. Teeth fall out. Your eyes get blurred. Shall we stop? Yeah, let's, let's stop. Let's stop. The truth is physical change is natural in the aging process. Have you attended your 40th year high school reunion? Have you guys attended that? Did you get there and you arrive and you're like, who are you? Who, who, you don't recognize anybody? Everyone's so changed. I know for some people, they change as much as they can, wanting to, be, wanting to change their physical appearance, wanting to change themselves physically. Nothing wrong with that if your goal is to be healthy and strong. But if you're consumed and obsessed with wanting to change what's physical about you for the sake of being admired and being beautiful, then you're going in the wrong direction. The change that we all need to make in ourselves is not external. It's internal. Would you agree? The title of our message today is God Never Changes, but God Changes Hearts. Can you all say that? God Never Changes, 
But God changes hearts. Now let me ask you, what do you want to change about your life? What do you want to change about your life? I know if I ask your spouse, your children, or your parents, they'll have lots to say, okay? You might have lots to say about what they need to change. But what about you personally? What about you personally? What I want you to do right now is just write down in a piece of paper, write down on your cell phone, write down what are the three major areas that you want to change in your life. Go ahead and do that now. Go ahead. Pull out your cell phones and do that right now. It's so glad to see so many doing it. Go ahead. Great. You know, this message will have no meaning for you if you don't write it down. As I speak, I want you to think about the things you wrote and see how they can apply in your personal life. Okay? Good. Keep writing. Keep writing. Great. Just three, huh? Not more than three. Just three. Keep it simple. What are the three areas that you need to change in your life? I'm so glad that everyone's doing this. Great. I'm not going to collect it. I'm not going to ask you to text me. I'm not going to ask you to share it to the person beside you. That's why you can do it for yourself. Just do it for yourself. Make it as a text message. Don't send it out to anyone. Just keep it for yourself. All right. Three areas in your life that you need to change. What are those three things? Is it perhaps a temper? Controlling your anger, your lustful thoughts, complaining, critical spirit, uncontrollable tongue, filled with curse words. Is it gossip? Is it slander? Is it maligning? Could it be impatience? Are you impatient? Are you anxious? Are you filled with heavy worries? Is it fear? Is it selfishness? Self-centeredness? being self-absorbed. Are you lazy? Complacent? Not keeping your word? Always late for your appointments? Is it an addiction to computer games? Social media? Pornography? Overeating? Shopping? Materialism? Is it drugs? Getting drunk? Homosexuality? Lesbianism or immorality. How is it when you drive, when you drive around in traffic? Is it possibly that you are living with unforgiveness and because of this you are bitter, storing hate and vengeance in your heart? What are the areas of your life that need change? Have you written down three of them already? Yes? Do you need more time? Just, just keep writing them down as we talk, Okay. Keep writing them down. Now, the very first step, friends, the very first step to make change is to identify. Identify what is it that I need to change in my life. Identify it. This takes humility. This takes a lot of courage to do. It's not easy to look inside it and see really what area. Be serious and, and brutally honest with yourself. What areas do I need to change? Because the truth is, although God loves you and is willing to accept you as you are, as is where is, his love refuses to leave you the way you are. He wants you to have a heart like Jesus. That's his desire. God is unchanging, but he wants to change us. In other words, God loves you so much that he's going to do whatever he can to change you. And that might mean sending circumstances upon your life, tests, trials, in order for you to be more like his son Jesus. The Bible calls this sanctification, a big word which simply means God's action and activity in your life to make you more Christ-like. That's what it's all about. His purpose and desire is for you to be like Christ, not to stay the way you are. Can you refuse to be changed? That's the question. Can you refuse to be quit changed? Yes. yes. Easily. All you have to do is fight it, oppose it, defy God's changes, challenge His changes, Refuse to change. But in the end, my dear friends, you'll be the greatest loser. You'll be the greatest loser. Today, I want to give you the opportunity to discover how God changes our hearts. Do you want to learn? We're going to look at it from the passage of Ezekiel chapter 36. This is the passage which brings out this whole truth about how God desires to change us. Let's read it. Verse 1, verse 24. For I will take you from the nations 
gather you from all the lands and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you will be careful to observe my ordinances. You will live in the land that I gave to your forefathers. So you will be my people and I will be your God. Through this passage, we're going to see three key areas of how God changes hearts. Number one is repentance. Number two is replacement. And number three is renewal. When we repent of our ways, God comes in and He renews our hearts. He replaces our lives with His Spirit. And He allows us to celebrate a victory of new life. A life that we can live in the power of His Holy Spirit. Let me show you. Ezekiel chapter 36 verse 24 says, For I will take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands, and bring you into your own land. What's the background here? What's the context of this passage? You have to understand, the Israelites were in Judah, Jerusalem, and they were attacked and invaded by uh, the Babylonians. They came in, they destroyed the whole city, and they took all the people, all the Israelites, and they kidnapped them and brought them to Babylon. And they were made slaves in Babylon under the reign of King Nebuchadnezzar. In that place, God raised one of his people, one of the Israelites, a man by the name of Ezekiel, to be the prophet. And God spoke to Ezekiel, and Ezekiel delivered the message of God to the people. And so that's why this is being told to them. You have to understand, the people of Israel, they knew their God. They knew they were chosen. They heard about God's faithfulness from their fathers. They knew that they were being judged by God by being kidnapped from their homeland, their promised land, and being brought to Babylon. They knew that what was happening to them was a punishment because they turned their backs on God. At this stage, they were lost in their own sin. They did not put their trust in God, but they put their trust in their own work of their hands. They lived to satisfy their own sinful desires and pleasures. They did not live to please God. They did not love God. They did not love others as they were commanded to do. Does that sound a little bit like you today? You can come here Sunday after Sunday, listen to His Word, but when you leave, you turn your mind around and you say, I just live my life the way I want. You defy what God is telling you. You put yourselves and all that you love in danger by doing that. If you persist in living life your way against God, you're in for a great awakening. God never changes, but God changes hearts. Point number one is repentance. Can you all say repentance? Repentance. Ezekiel chapter 36 verse 25 says, everyone, then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Look what this verse is telling us. First and foremost, it's I. I will sprinkle clean. I will clean you. I will remove all the filthiness. It's God doing it in our lives. It's not what we do. It's God doing it in our lives. And he's speaking figuratively here. He says, I will sprinkle clean water on you. He wants to cleanse us from all the pollution, all the filth of sin in our lives, all the false gods, all the false worship, all the false false mindsets, all the false hopes that we might have. He wants to get rid of all that in our lives. Friends, do you realize that the danger is if you choose to consistently deny that there's sin in your life that you need to address and you continue to let that linger and continue to take root in your life, it's like poison. It's going to slowly but surely wreak havoc in your life, in your spirit. It's going to ruin you. It's going to ruin the people around you. It's going to ruin relationships. It's going to cause you to be disconnected from God. And so his desire is to cleanse us from all the filthiness. Today, are you hiding sins from yourself? Are you harboring sins, trying to think that this is not going to affect anybody? Friends, do you have a problem with hurts, habits, addictions that are running your life, that are stealing away your life? 
I heard a story about this man. I'm sure you all know him. His name is Houdini, the great Houdini. Do you know Houdini? As I was growing up, Houdini was, was always intriguing to me with his magic, his illusions. But he was known most especially as being the greatest escape artist. He perfected his style so he can, he can escape from whatever chains, bondages, straight jackets, whatever you put him, he can escape from it. And he boasted and bragged to all people that, oh, you put me in a jail cell and I can be out in 30 minutes. Well, one day in the British Isles, there was a new prison that was established and a new jail cell was built. And they challenged Houdini. They said, come on over, give us a try. Houdini said, sure, I'll go there. He goes into the prison cell, bursting with confidence and security. After they locked him in the, in the cell, he entered without a, a shirt, and he only had shorts. They closed the door. Immediately, he pulled out from his, from his guard, he pulled out this long 10-inch steel flexible piece of metal, and he started working on the, on the jail lock. And he was working on it. He, he was working double time, really hard. After 30 minutes, his confident expression started to disappear. After one hour, he was filled with perspiration. After two hours, he was totally exhausted that he literally collapsed. And when he collapsed, he hit the gate and the door flew open. <laughs> Do you know what happened? He realized that the gate was never locked. It was never locked. But it was only locked in one place. In his mind. That's the only place it was locked. And friends, the truth is, if something is locked in your mind, it is completely locked. You can be free. And that's the truth. For all of us, we can be free. We can be free of all our hurts and habits and, and hang-ups and addictions and sins. And that's what God wants us to be. He wants us to live in freedom. In the book of Galatians, chapter 5, verse 13, it says, For you have been what? You have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters. We've been called to live in freedom. I should know. As a young Christian, I was bitter. I was angry. I was filled with, with vengeance in my heart. People betrayed me, and I didn't trust them. I was so angry that every time I thought of them, I saw them, this, this hate would just rile up in my heart. As a young Christian, I was an immoral person. I cheated on my girlfriends. I was stealing and lying and, and trying to get ahead, trying to be successful and rich by doing all these devious things, immoral life. That was me. As a young Christian, I thought my life was okay. No one knows about this, but every time, every time I was tempted or memories of, of those things came upon me, it triggered. It triggered this inner reaction. And I realized that I was in a jail cell. Just like Houdini, a jail that I was, I was in prison in my own mind, lost, hopeless, because I could not get out. It was like the door of my life was locked. I could not live in, in freedom and celebration of that freedom. Friends, listen to this. Your past does not define your future. Remember that. Whatever happened in your past, it does not define. It does not mean that your future is, is going to be the same. No, it can change. And one day for me, it finally did. When I discovered that the door of my mind was not locked, I could walk out. I could walk in freedom forever. Why? Because God gave me a solution. And the solution is the word repentance. Can you all say that? Repentance. Repentance, friends. You know what that means? You know what repentance means? Don't be shocked. Repentance means change of what? Mind. It means change of mind. You and I, if we want to change, we don't have to struggle. We don't have to do somersaults and flips and, and, and do all kinds of things that would cause us blood, sweat, and tears. No. Friends, we need to just humbly go before our God and with a sorrowful heart, with regret and shame, seek His forgiveness through repentance. We have to make a choice in our minds to do this. In the New Testament, it clearly says it there. It says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22, everyone, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, continue, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, the, mind, the thoughts, the minds, and our body, what? Washed with pure water. This is God's desire. Remember when Jesus was washing the feet of his disciples? Peter stood up and said, Jesus, you're never washing my feet. But Jesus said, Peter, if I do not wash your feet, you have no part in me. 
Again, the symbol of, of cleansing. Friends, it's not enough to want to change. It's not enough to desire to change. It's not enough to dream of changing. It's not enough to say, I'm going to change one day. No, you've got to make a choice, a decision to change your mind. It's not going to happen automatically. And a lot of times we think, oh, I'm waiting on God to change me. Oh, friends, understand this. Stop waiting on God because God is waiting on you. God is waiting on you. You can't change everything or anything, but God can change you. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, it says there, if we what? Confess. Continue. Our sin, He is what? Faithful and righteous to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. A lot of people think repentance is just a one-time event in your life. You repent once and that's it. No. Friends, because you want to keep your fellowship with God. You and I, we, when we sin daily, we need to come before Him and ask for His forgiveness. We are already forgiven, but we restore that fellowship through confession. The word confess is important because confess or repent is actually the Greek word metanoia. Can you all say metanoia? Metanoia. You know what metanoia means? It means change of mind, a change of mind. The most positive thing you can ever do in your life is to change your mind. Why? When you go to God in repentance, He exchanges it with His peace. He gives you a peace of mind. He gives you His forgiveness, His cleansing. And when you live with, that, with the cleansing forgiveness of God, it liberates you. It sets you free. If you're looking for a formula for repentance in the Bible, let me show you. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. Let's read this. And my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and what? Seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. The context of this was the Israelites. God was saying, if you want to change your life as a nation, you need to come together and do this. But for us individually, how does this apply? First and foremost, it says, my people, my name. Do you today have a relationship with God? Are you, have you entrusted your life to Him? Can you call yourself one of His children? Do you call yourself by His name? That's the very first thing. You've got to be connected to Him in that intimate relationship. And then it says, humble, humble themselves. Humility is one of the hardest things in life because we're all proud. We all have this determination of, I want to do things myself. I want to gain confidence, and, and it's all about self. But humility is, is simply coming to God with honesty. No pretense of pride. No boasting. Just sincere honesty. This is who I am, Lord. So you come before God, and we come before Him with the most powerful resource that He's given us, and that is prayer. It says, pray and pray. Pour out your heart to God. Just express your heart's sorrow. Tell Him everything that you desire him to do to your sin. Come before him in prayer. And then it goes on to say, seek my face. Seek my face. You know what that means? Be intimate with him. See God for who he is in all his majesty, his sovereignty, his grace, his being almighty. See God for who he is. Seek his face. Because when you seek him and you, you understand who your God is, then you go to the next one. And then turn from your wicked ways. This is the repentant part. Repent. Turn from your wicked ways, meaning walk away, run away in the opposite direction of where you're going. Make that decision. Turn from your wicked ways. And the verse continues to say, and he will hear from heaven. Truly, God listens. He knows what's going on in your life. He sees your tears. He sees your cry. He knows the pain that you're going through. And that's God. He hears you. And he will not only hear you, but it goes on to say, he will forgive your sin. Forgiveness is the most liberating action you can ever receive. Forgiveness brings freedom. It's the unchaining of bondage from all kinds of sins in your life. But he doesn't just forgive you. He goes on to say, heal you. And he brings healing upon you. That means he gives you a brand new start. 
He gives you a clean slate. He gives you a second chance in life. Friends, that's all this comes about from repentance. I'm sure many of you here today are different from the way you were a few years ago. You've been able to get rid of some sins with God's help in your life, but today you're walking and, and you're feeling that my life is okay, but there's still some sins I indulge in. There's still some things that are holding on to me, that, causing me, that are causing me to, to lose the joy, to lose really life in abundance. You're committing these sins that are holding you from your past. And let's face it, friends, the truth is we are all addicted to sin. That's the way we are. This is why we must humble ourselves, humble ourselves and come before the Lord and not just say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. No, no. Go to him and specify what is the sin that you wanted to forgive you of. Tell him exactly what is that sin. Tell him exactly the sin and repent it. Bring it before the feet of his cross and tell him, Lord, with all sincerity, with a broken heart, total dependence upon him, pour out your hearts to him. Friends, the principle here is repentance changes my mind and God cleanses my heart of sin. Can you all say that? Repentance changes my mind and God cleanses my heart of sin. You cannot beat sin on your own strength. No way. You don't have the strength. You don't have the willpower. God is the one who gives you the strength and the power to beat it. Change happens not by trying but by trusting, not by struggling, but by surrendering, by surrendering. I believe in my heart today, some of you here may be Christian atheists. You know what I'm talking about? Christian atheists, they call themselves Christian, but they live as if God is dead. And you might be the most miserable person right now, because in your heart, you, you claim to be a follower of Christ, but yet in your life actions, he's not even there. And because of that, you're, you're in, the, in the mire, in the mud of sin. And you cannot seem to get out. And you're hurting deep down inside. You're even depressed, thinking that there's no hope in life. Dear friend, can I just say, if today your problems are overwhelming, you feel helpless, it's all because you've chosen in your mind that there is no God. Don't do this to yourself. Turn around. And that's why living can be, living can be so de de des desperate. It can be such despair. But I want to encourage you. Right now, I want to encourage you to, to set aside all those, all those lies about God in your life and fill it with the truth that God is alive. God is present in your life today. And He can change whatever situation you're faced with. You know, I want to make this time really meaningful. Really meaningful. So, that list that you're holding on to right now, those three areas in your life, let's take the very first step. Let's repent. Let's just spend a few moments coming before the Lord. Look at that list, just yourself, and just, just repent before the Lord. Pour out your heart to Him. Let's do that right now. Lord, you know the desire of our hearts are to be cleansed to be set free, to live without doing these things over and over again. We acknowledge, Lord, that there's nothing we can do on our own. It's only by your power and your spirit that we can overcome and be victorious over these sins. Father, you've already sent Jesus to die to pay for these sins but we're still holding on to them with our flesh, with our sinful ways. Help us, Lord, now to truly turn these over to you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you've heard the cry of our hearts. Thank you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Point number one is repentance. Point number two is replacement. Can you all say replacement? Replacement. In Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26, it says there, Moreover, I will what? Give you a new heart. Continue. And put a new heart, a new spirit within you. And I will what? Remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of 
flesh. Notice, again, God says, I, I will give you a new heart. I will put my spirit within you. I will remove, I will give you the heart of flesh. That's all God doing it in our lives. He wants to replace what is wrong in our lives. Friends, you have to understand, what is the word heart here? You see the word heart in the Bible, and what does it mean? The heart, the word heart in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew language, is the word lebab. Can you all say lebab? Not kebab, but lebab. Okay? So, gentlemen, you want to say to your wives tonight, Honey, I love you with all of my lebab. Doesn't sound too nice, no? But that's what it is, lebab. What is lebab? Lebab is your heart. And when the Bible uses the word heart, it talks about all your emotions, all your feelings. It talks about your intellect. It talks about your attitude, your, your response, your, your whole being. It's all about who you really are. That's your heart. What comes to your mind when you, when you hear the, the word hard heart, the phrase hard heart? What comes to mind? No, no, not who comes to mind, but what comes to mind? What is someone who has a hard heart? Stubborn, yes. Unrepentant, okay. Here, someone who is proud, uncaring, indifferent, cold, callous, does not listen, unwilling to adjust, independent, independent of God, unforgiving, no compassion, rebellious. Now, do any of these resemble your character? I hope not. This is a hard heart. In Tagalog, hard heart is what? Pusong bato. Yes. And in Tagalog, uh, heart of flesh is what? Pusong mamon. Yes. Not pusong saging. Ha? Pusong mamon. <laughs> Here's the question. What is the reason we all sin? What is the reason we all sin? Simple question, but difficult to answer, right? But the answer is this. The reason people are immoral... They're selfish, they're addicted, they're unforgiving, they are uh, adulterers, immoral, immoral, etc. It's because they are, their hearts are filled with self-love. You know self-love? You love yourself so much that you don't care about anybody else much, much as, as much as God. You don't care about anybody else, even God. You want to do things your way because that's what gives you pleasure. That's what gives you, you know, the satisfaction in life. You're selfish and every time you're faced with a decision, because of self-love, I'll choose to do it for myself. That's the reason we sin. That's the reason people are cheaters and stealers and liars, etc. It's because of self-love. Now, this is different from what the Bible says in Matthew 22, verse 37. Jesus said, Jesus replied, everyone, love the Lord your God with what? All your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You see, the Bible says, love yourself. But loving yourself there is not the same as self-love. Do you see the difference? Loving yourself here is you love yourself so that you are committed to other people. You're, you love yourself from the love of God, and that love is an overflowing love that extends to others and to God himself. Last week we learned love is a commitment. Continue. Love is a commitment towards imperfect people seeking their highest good, oftentimes requiring sacrifice, but leads to the glory of God. You have good memory, huh? Very good. Okay. Love is a commitment towards imperfect people, seeking their highest good, oftentimes requiring sacrifice, but all giving glory to God. Unless you change your heart with God's heart, you may never get rid of your sins. Because having a sinful heart, a selfish heart, will always lead you back to the temptation and the action of your sin. You'll always want to, to fill that emptiness in your heart with gratification. You'll always want that, that fleeting moment of worthless enjoyment because you don't know any better. And that's what will, will lead your heart, fleeting pleasure. God actually wants to give all of us a heart transplant. He wants to change our heart. He give us a new whole heart, a new eternity. The greatest heart surgeon there ever is, there ever will be, is God himself. And he's more than willing to give us a new heart. We need, the Bible says, a heart of flesh. A heart of flesh. And this heart can come only from God himself. And that's why we need a savior. We don't need religion because religion only makes us appear on the external as religious. It doesn't help us on the internal. 
God wants to give us a Savior to do a major heart transplant in our lives. He wants to remove the heart of stone. He wants to remove that hard heart. And He wants to replace it with a new heart. His promise is this. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And this is so key. He's saying He will put His new spirit, His spirit in us. A new heart of flesh and a heart of His spirit. You know what that means? Friends, a heart of God and the Spirit of God living in us enjoys the love of God. It's a heart that's controlled. It's controlled by the love of God. It shares the love of God with others. It's a heart that is willing to be corrected. A heart that is very obedient, very humble, very compassionate. It's a heart that is filled with peace and God's love. That's the Spirit of God when it comes into your life. It changes you. Here's the question. Are you involved in this transaction? Are you involved in, in replacing your heart with God's heart? What is your, your partake in this whole transaction? Friends, listen. This is where the responsibility of man and the sovereign grace of God are shown to be coexistent. Man cannot change his own heart. Cannot change his own heart unless God does it for him. Unless God changes it for him. It's God and man working together. We cannot assist God, but we can resist God. We can resist God. I came across a beautiful story about this little girl named Jenny. She went to the toy store with her mother, and as they're walking down the aisle, she saw this toy pearl bracelet. And she picked it up and says, Mommy, can you please buy this for me? The mommy said, Are you sure you want that? And the daughter said, Yes, please. The mom saw it was only 20 pesos. So she bought it for, for Jenny, and Jenny put it on, and she loved it. Every night before she sleeps, the father reads her a Bible story. So after reading the Bible story, the father said, Jenny, do you love your daddy? And Jenny says, Daddy, you know I love you. And the daddy said, can I have your pearl bracelet? And Jenny says, oh, no, Daddy, this is mine. Mommy just gave me this. I love this bracelet. Okay, Jenny. They went to sleep. Next day, he read a story again and asked Jenny, Jenny, do you love me? And Jenny says, Daddy, you know that I love you. Jenny, can I have your pearl bracelet? And Jenny says, oh, Daddy, you can have my, my Barbie doll, but not my pearl bracelet. And so he said, okay. The next day, he did the same thing. Do you love me? And she says, Daddy, you know I love you. Can I have your pearl bracelet? Oh, Daddy, you can have my stuffed toys and my red, my pen and my, uh, my headband, but, but not my pearl bracelet. They went to sleep. After seven days, you know, before he even asked her this time, with a little sadness in her heart, Jenny says, Daddy, I love you. I want to give you my pearl bracelet. And the dad said, are you sure you really want to give, it, give this to me? And he says, yes, Daddy, it, it's yours. I know that you want it. And he says, well, honey, he pulled out from his pocket a black velvet case with gold lining. He opened it up, and inside was a real pearl bracelet. And he put it on her, on her wrist and said, Jenny, I don't want you to wear a fake pearl bracelet anymore. I want you to wear the real one because you're my princess, and I love you. You know, friends, oftentimes we hold on to what we think is good, not realizing that God has something that's even better. He wants to replace all the cheap, all the fake things in our lives, like our sins, our, our addictions, our hurts. He wants to replace all of that so that He can give us something better, not just something better, but something that is the best for us. He wants to replace all your sins and addictions. He wants to replace whatever is counterfeit in your life. Replace what destroys you. Replace what keeps you away from, from Him. He wants to replace your life with His happiness and His holiness. Like Jenny, you will receive the best when you're willing to allow God to replace it in your life. Friends, whatever you give your hearts to will change you. When you spend time idolizing something or someone as, as you spend time, countless hours with whatever that is, you become like that, that thing. You become what you behold. But if you spend time with God, you study His Word, you get to know more about Him, you pray to Him, you establish that relationship with Him, you share Him with others. As you spend time with God, you behold the image of His Son, Jesus Christ, in your life. What's the principle we learn here? The principle is this. Replacement changes my heart of self-love to God's heart of selfless love. Can you all say that? Replacement changes my heart of self-love to God's heart of selfless love. 
who we're so privileged to have with us, a dear brother who's going to share a part of his life with us. Please welcome Mike Reyes. Hi. I'm Mike Reyes, a follower of Christ, who is now depending on the Lord for boldness to share my story with you. I was raised in a family where the breadwinner was my father and the home manager was my mother. Our life was simple and comfortable. We did not have any major family conflicts, but our lack of intimate communication gave me the impression that I was my own problem solver. As a teen, I coped with boredom and difficulties through music and barcada. Later on, pornography came into the picture when cousins and friends introduced me to an abundance of materials that developed my habit-forming way of relieving stress. My first job after college was in advertising, an industry where attractive females abound. It was there that I discovered the pleasure in taking pictures of eye-catching women. I enjoyed the photos I took of them and felt satisfaction in persuading the ladies to pose as models for me. I carried on with my behavior even when I was already married to Mavic, who shared the gospel with me in college. I considered myself religious at that time, but as God continued to reveal himself to me through his word, I felt a desire for something I never personally experienced before, a purposeful and vibrant relationship with him. God convicted me of my secret sin, which greatly displeased him, and I truly wanted to stop. Yet I wavered even when my wife had repeatedly caught me in possession of pornographic materials. I would apologize to her and fight my compulsions, then crumble when stress and fleshly desires became overwhelming. I felt horrible each time. But as usual, I dealt with the problem, believing that sheer willpower was enough. I was wrong. Instead, my problem turned into a tiresome on-and-off routine which broke my wife's heart and affected our intimacy. Also, our kids became anxious and troubled as they became more painfully aware of their Christian father's addiction to lustful desires. Time came when my, family, my, my wife finally had enough. When she again caught me viewing a pornographic website, she considered leaving me. This was a turning point when I realized how deceitful and wicked my heart was. I cried out to God. Thankfully, God stepped in. He knew I was powerless. He knew I was in danger of further ruining my life and my family. Hence, He extended mercy to me by granting Mavic the strength to stay despite her anguish. I knew I did not deserve this, not with all the things I had done, but the Lord graciously granted me another chance for repentance and redemption. Then, as God would have it, we found ourselves in the Glorious Hope program. As I began to surrender my will to God in the months that followed, He made me realize that I was deeply entrenched in my addiction to pornography because I never had a reverential fear of Him. I knew Christ as my Savior, but I did not yield to Him as Lord over all the areas of my life. This time around, God helped me understand the depth of His patient and unconditional love for me and made it clear that I needed to take His character and standard of holiness seriously. These caused a change in my heart and led me to a decision to consistently and intentionally walk in His ways with the Lord with trembling and respect for Him and His commands. Only then was I able to confess my sins before the Lord and my family and say no to the fleshly appetites that had competed with the Lord for a place in my heart. To this day, God continues to build my character and integrity as our family's spiritual head and disciple to our kids through prayer, openness in our conversations, and family devotions. 
He also gives me opportunities to make amends for devaluing my wife's feelings, for destroying her self-esteem and betraying her trust. I have become more appreciative of Mavic, and I sincerely acknowledge her as one of the, my greatest blessings from the Lord. I admit there are times when sinful pleasures of old creep up to tempt me. But the Lord is quick to remind me of the joy that constant fellowship with Him brings. He remains faithful and overflowing with grace as He grants me the strength to fight temptation on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. I am aware that the enemy will not let up, but I hold on to the truth that I can overcome through the power of the Lord God Almighty. My battle continues and I may even stumble along the way. But I know God will pick me up and equip me with all I need to run my race with perseverance. As I fix my eyes on the Savior, I am comforted and strengthened by the same assurance he gave Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. All glory and honor to the Lord Jesus Christ. What's the title of our message today? God never changes. God changes hearts. Point number three is renewal. Can you all say renewal? Renewal. In Ezekiel 36, verse 37, it continues. God says, I will put my what? My spirit within you. Continue. And cause you to walk in my statutes. And you, will, and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. Notice, I will put my spirit within you, and because his spirit is in us, it'll cause us to walk in his statutes, follow and observe him, walk with him. You're probably asking yourself, okay, this whole thing about renewal, the spirit coming into me, how does that happen? How do I get a, a heart transplant? How does that happen? First and foremost, God is more than willing to transplant your heart, to change your heart. You don't have to beg him to do that. Remember two words. The two words are openness and emptiness. Can you all say that? Openness and emptiness. For example, I just happen to have a jar here. Now, this jar, can I fill this jar with anything? What, what must I do first? I must open it, right? I must open the jar. Because if I don't open the jar, I can't put anything in. Now, can I fill the jar now? Not yet. But first, when you fill, when you open the jar, this shows your willingness. There must be a willingness. You're saying, Lord, I'm going to open my life to you. Let your spirit fill me now. But you have to do the second thing, and that is remove whatever is inside, whatever is holding you back, whatever that sin is. There must be a sense of need, a sense of need. Lord, I'm empty. I'm empty. And now, Lord, I need you to fill, need to be filled by your spirit. It's, it's a voluntary yielding. As long as you're covered, as long as you're filled, there's no way that God can come into your life. But if you empty yourself of self, and you say, Lord, I yield myself to you. I yield myself to your power. Fill me, Lord God. Allow me to, to live by your power, a veil of your power. That's when it happens. That's when the replacement happens. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 23 and 25 says this clearly. It says, instead, let the what? The Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes put on your new nature created to be like God truly righteous and holy it continues to say so stop lying stop telling lies you see the spirit is there we just we need to renew our thoughts put on the new nature God has given us a new nature we just have to put it on we have to just apply it in our lives it says stop telling lies people today they tell themselves so many lies let me tell you a story. There was this woman who was walking to her, to her office every day, and as she was walking to the office, there was a pet shop. And beside the pet shop was a parrot, like this. And as she walked by on the sidewalk, the parrot looks at her and, and says, Lady, you're really ugly. Wow, how dare you say that to me? She was disgusted. She walked on to work. Coming back, she went, walked a different direction. Anyway, the following day, she decided to go again to the office. She forgot about the parrot. She walked on the sidewalk where the parrot was, and as she was walking, the parrot looks at her and says, Lady, you're ugly. 
She was so mad. She entered the pet shop, looked for the owner, and told the owner, I don't like what your bird says, telling me I'm ugly. You better do something about that bird or tomorrow I'm going to sue you. The owner was so scared and asked for forgiveness. Please, I'm sorry that that happened. That will not happen tomorrow. I promise you, that bird will not do that to you tomorrow. The following day, she was walking on the sidewalk, really, you know, confident that that, that won't happen again. As she's walking, she sees the parrot. They look eye to eye. And with dagger eyes, she tells the parrot, what? And the parrot says, you know. <laughs> Friends, you need to renew the truth in your mind and not listen to your inner parrot. Many of us have this inner parrot in our minds telling us, you're ugly, you're worthless, you're, you're no good, you're a waste. You know, that, that continues to play in our minds. We have this inner parrot that we carry around with us. And that parrot is so cruel, it's so rude. You don't even need the devil anymore to accuse you and discourage you. No, you do it to yourself. You constantly do it to yourself. These feelings of worthlessness will drive you back to your sin. That fleeting pleasure, that gratification that's just temporal. And that's why you need to change your mind. Get rid of that inner parrot. As a matter of fact, you know, just fry, fry him in olive oil, you know, with chili and garlic. Get rid of that parrot, okay? Start listening to what God says. Start listening to what God says. You are a child of God. You are chosen you are blessed, you are loved, you are forgiven, you are blessed beyond imagination. God can use you no matter what weakness you have. He can use you to bring glory and honor to himself. Stop listening to what people say and start listening to what God says. That's what you need to do. Remember, renew your mind with the truth. The truth. Don't listen to what your inner parrot says. When God wants to renew us, sometimes he has to remake us. In the book of Jeremiah, it talks about a potter who was making a, a pot out of clay. And it says there, the clay was spoiled in the hand of the potter. So he what? He remade it into another vessel as it pleased the potter to make. Oftentimes, we are spoiled. We are broken. We become useless the way we are. So what does God do? As a potter, he reshapes us. He remakes us. He remolds us. He, he renews our life. And when we are renewed, people will look at us and say, I want what you have. I want what you have. And friends, the only way we're going to win people to Christ and draw them to Christ in these last days is when they experience the love of God flowing from our lives to them. And when they see our lives and our actions, our words, with this peace, this peace that, that is within us, with confidence that in God all things are possible. And people look at you and they say, how can you be so confident, so at peace in spite of the tragedy that's happened in your life? How can that, how can that be? Where is it coming from? And that's where you come out and tell them about God in your life. I, wanna, I want you to ask me, ask me, how does the Holy Spirit come and work into your life? Go ahead, ask me. How does the Holy Spirit work in your life? And the answer is gradually. Gradually. Let me show you. 2 Corinthians 3.18. It says there, and the Lord, continue, who is the Spirit, makes us what? More and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. Notice, it's more and more like Him. It's not a one-time deal. And I love this verse because it tells us that it's a process. God takes us through that process. It's not instant. It's not microwave transformation. It's not like after today, after this message, all of you walk out and I'm changed. No, no, no. no. Remember, it took years for you to build up these hurts, these habits, these addictions, these sins. It's going to take a little time, God's time, to remove that from your life. But don't also use that as an excuse that God's still working on me. No, no. You've got to do your part. You've got to do your part. When Cindy and I counsel, sometimes married couples, they pour out their hearts to us. They share the difficulties they're having. We ask them, how long have you been married? Oh, 25 years. And how long have you had this problem in your marriage? Oh, about 10 years. Okay, and so you want us now in this next hour to fix your problem. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. It takes time. But change in your heart will happen gradually. Don't expect instant transformation. But isn't that a relief to know? It's great to know that. Even a caterpillar, 
Even a caterpillar takes time to transform into a butterfly. The principle we learn here is this, renewal. Renewal changes my life of lies with God's spirit of truth. Can you all say that? Renewal changes my life of lies with God's spirit of truth. When you replace those lies with God's spirit of truth, it changes your life. In Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 28, these are the results. You will live in the land that I gave to your forefathers, so you will be my people and I will be your God. Isn't that great to hear? When you have gone through the repentance, the replacement, and the renewal, you are now in God's presence, in not just his presence, but you are in the abundant, you're living in the abundance of his presence. You're not feeling, you're not feeling that there's lack. You're not feeling that something's wrong. You're hiding from God. You're completely enveloped in his presence. And, and the essence of this, friends, is this, that you will have the power to change the way you have relationships. You will break bondages. You will heal relationships. You'll be so forgiven that you can forgive others. When you have Jesus in you, it produces a life that you will never have any other way on your own. Jesus' new heart miracle can save your marriage. It can save your future. It can save your soul. It can, it can save your life. And only the sovereign grace of God can do this in our lives. What is the evidence? What is the evidence of this really happening in your life? The last verse, it says in verse 31, then you will remember. What do you remember? Your evil ways and your deeds that were not good. And when you remember them, notice it says, and you will what? You will loathe, you'll despise, you'll, 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 yeah, okay, that. Yourself in your what? In your own sight for your iniquities and your ab ab abominations. In other words, when you look back to the, what, what you were doing before, you will say, how revolting that was. It's terrible. I don't ever have to do anything with that again. I want to stay away from that completely. That's the evidence that change has really happened in your life. Dr. Christian Barnard, a doctor who was instrumental in the very first heart plant, the first human heart tr transplant. This is not putting a, a pacemaker. This is putting heart to heart, okay? He performed this, and it was a worldwide um, incredible feat that happened after one of the transplants, the very first one, Dr. Barnard went to the patient and asked the patient, how are you? And he said, I'm doing fine. What can I do for you? And the patient said, well, I'd like to see my old heart. Wow, what a request. But Dr. Barnard said, well, let's get it. It was in a jar in formaldehyde. They brought it up to the, to the room. And here the patient started looking at the heart, at his old heart. And he stared and stared and said nothing for such a long time. And Dr. Barnard realized that this was a, a remarkable event because for the very first time in history, a man was looking at his own heart. And as the patient stared at the heart, he saw that it was flabby, it was enlarged, and it was obvious that that heart would not last very long. And as he was pondering this, this whole event, the patient broke out in silence. And he said, I'm glad I don't have that old heart anymore. Friends, you can say the same thing. I'm so glad I don't have that heart anymore. The secret to changing your life is not willpower. It is God guiding you to do His will and giving you His power through the Holy Spirit to live a life pleasing to Him. Remember that. God never changes, but God changes hearts. Repentance, renewal, replacement, and renewal. Did you learn something today? I pray that you would apply this in your own life. You know, this past week I was inspired again. I don't know why. <laughs> Do you mind? Huh? For those of you who are here for the first time, you're probably, what, what's this talking about? I don't know, sometimes when I give a message, I get inspired to write a poem. And I wrote another poem, but this time it's different. This is a poem with a prop. Is that okay? Here's my prop. My wife is going to get mad. I'm using her glass cake display. You know what a banana cream pie is? This is a banana cream pie. Let me, let me show you a close-up of this picture, huh? 
Look at the close-up. Can you see that closer? Okay. Here's the poem. It's entitled, Banana, Cream Pie, and Jesus. <laughs> As I stand here, holding this banana cream pie, looking at it makes it clear that it will never satisfy. Only one slice is filled with whipped cream on top. This makes me sad and want to send it back to the shop. Just like our life, many times is cut into slices. Trying our best, we can never hide our vices. Are we guilty of only allowing Jesus to occupy a portion of our life? Maybe that's why our half-hearted commitment causes us so much strife. Through my Jesus slice, I try to appear godly, good, and upright for all to see. But sadly, all my other slices of life overshadow the real Jesus in me. Jesus desires that my entire life be filled with his love. So everyone around me tastes and sees the beauty from above. If I truly believe he is my Lord, my whole pie would be covered in whipped cream. And there would be no doubt that my heart is changed and I'm part of his team. Thank you. Let's join our hearts in prayer. Father in heaven, we praise you. We thank you for being an incredible, loving God, a God who knows us in and out. You know what we're all struggling with, Father. And our prayer, Lord, as we heard your word today, that our lives would be changed. May each and every single one of us apply these truths in our lives, take these steps to allow you to change our hearts. We love you, Lord, and we know that without you, we are absolutely helpless and hopeless. We need you in our lives. Thank you, Father, that you come to our rescue, that you come to redeem us and to restore us, to make us exactly what you want us to be, more like your son, Jesus Christ. I pray for all the hearts here, Lord God, that we will be inspired and challenged to take steps in this direction. We love you and we thank you. We give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor that you and you alone deserve. We pray this in Jesus' most precious name. Amen and amen. Glory be to God. I love you guys.